Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Neelanjana Banerjee, and I'm the managing editor of Kaya Press, and so happy to welcome everyone to this wonderful event tonight, a transnational dialogue on science fiction with Bo Young Kim and Nalo Hopkinson. As one of the publishers of Korean writer Bo Young Kim, I'm especially excited that this event falls on International Translation Day. And happy to report that today's speakers are coming to you from across the world, South Korea, Los Angeles, Vancouver, and New York. I'm zooming in from East Los Angeles uh, or Tongva Gabrieleno land. Um, I'll ask the speakers uh, in the United States and Canada to share their own land acknowledgements in the chat or when they get up to speak. With the launch of the Kaya Press Magpie series in global Korean literature, Kaya has been excited to publish several volumes of speculative fiction. And in putting out this work from South Korean authors, I have been especially interested in this kind of transnational dialogue that we're having here today. What does it mean for world building to be undertaken by those in non-Western countries? What visions do they bring us? And what, it is, what is it like to undertake that work here in America as a writer of color? I'm so grateful to the writers for engaging in this conversation that I've been wanting to have and listen to for the last few years, and especially for my collaborators on the event for helping me put together. So just a few thank yous before we get started. A big thank you to Queens College for their support and the hosting of this event. Uh, and also really, really excited to let everyone know that this event is part of the Brooklyn Book Festival's bookend series. Uh, we'll drop the link of uh, the rest of the amazing events going on this week into the chat so you guys can check out some more things and the festival happening this weekend. Kaya Press is usually out there. Uh, one more year of us kind of doing it virtually and hopefully we'll be back soon to see you all out there. Uh, and also a thank you to the Korean Literature Foundation for their support of this work. I'll read the bios of everyone today and allow Dr. Chu to take over moderation for the rest of the event. Thank you so much. Uh, Bo Young Kim is an award-winning writer from South Korea. She regularly serves as a lecturer, juror for awards, and editor of sci-fi anthologies, and served as a consultant to Parasite director Bong Joon-ho's film, Snowpiercer. Two collections of her writing have been translated into English only this year. How exciting. Uh, On the Origin of Species and Other Stories, published by Kaya Press, which was recently long listed for the National Book Award in Translated Literature. So exciting. Um, and also, I'm waiting for you in other stories and novellas from HarperCollins. She lives in Gangwon Province, South Korea, with her family. Welcome, Boyan. We're also joined by Nalo Hopkinson, the first woman of African descent to receive the Damon Knight Memorial Grand Master Award, which is the lifetime honor from the Science Fiction Writers of America. Born in Jamaica, Hopkinson is the author of six novels, including the award-winning Brown Girl in the Ring, and her writing often draws on Caribbean language and traditions. She has been a finalist for a Nebula Award, won a fan World Fantasy Award, and many other honors. Our moderator this evening is Dr. So Young Chu, who wrote the brilliant Do Metaphors Dream of Literal Sleep, a science fictional theory of representation, digging into the matters which we are really talking about today, uh, and whose essay Free Indirect Suicide and Unfinished Fugue in H Minor, published in The Rumpus, was recently named as a notable essay of the year in Best American Essays 2020. She teaches at Queens College, CUNY. Chung Min Lee Comfort is one of the co-translators along with Sora Kim Russell of Bo Young Kim's On the Origin Species and Other Stories. And we'll be reading from her translation of Bo Young's work today alongside Bo Young. Uh, and Dr. Sun Young Park is joining us, an associate professor of East Asian Languages and Cultures and Gender Studies at the University of Southern California. She's the co-editor of Ready Made Bodhisattva, the Kaya Anthology of South Korean Science Fiction, which really launched our series. And she's the co-editor of the series, the Kaya Press Magpie series, along with Kaya publisher Sun Young Lee, which focuses on Korean, South Korean literature and speculative fiction. And so much of this is owed to her. Thank you for collaborating with me on this, Dr. Park. 
Uh, so I will hand it over now to uh, Dr. Chu. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We will put links for you to check out the author's works into the chat and, and please support them and buy their work. Um, and also the questions, any questions that you think of, please put into the Q&A tab there at the bottom of your screen and we will get to your questions hopefully by the end. Thank you, take care. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Okay, wonderful, welcome. And I am so honored to be part of this dialogue. Um, I just wanna start uh, with the uh, land acknowledgement. Flushing Queens is on Lenny Lenape and Metina Cock land. So uh, we are now going to move on to the uh, readings. Uh, Nalo Hopkinson will read from her short story, Soul Case. And Kim Bo Young and Jung Min Lee Comfort will read from Stars Shine in Earth Sky. Uh, Dr. Chu, um, <laughs> in my best Korean accent, which is not very good. I'm coming to everyone today from my adoptive home of Canada, and today marks Canada's first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. So I just wanted to say a little something first. The day honors the lost Indigenous children and survivors who were forced into residential schools and also honors their families and communities. They were subjected, these children, to physical and mental abuse. Many died as a result. There were 140 federally run Indian residential schools which operated in Canada between 1831 and 1998. The last school closed only 23 years ago. Indigenous communities are finding unmarked graves of lost children by the hundreds on the grounds of the former residential schools. Orange Shirt Day is an indigenous led grassroots commemorative day that honors the children who survived residential schools and remembers those who did not. Survivors advocated for recognition and reparations and demanded accountability for the lasting legacy of harms caused. This day is a partial response to demands that Canada acknowledge its history of, of attempts at genocide of indigenous peoples of this country. And I believe that wherever possible, what was stolen from indigenous peoples should be returned to them, including their lands. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from my forthcoming novel, Blackheart Man, and um, a warning, it's a story about war, and so it contains mentions of violence against adults, children, and animals. So this is from Blackheart Man. Moments after the sun's bottom lip cleared the horizon, the brigade charged down the hill. Kima stood with the rest of the Maroons, ready to give back blow for blow. The pistoliers advanced upon the waiting village compound, their silence unnerved. Only the paddy thump of the camel's wide feet made any sound. Kompong people murmured, stepped back. But Mother Letty gestured to the Garfoons defending them to stand still. So they did. Kima felt her palm slippery on her sharpened hoe. She'd known this day would come, but she didn't feel ready. Who could really make ready for something like this? The pistoliers advanced upon them in five rows some tens of impeccably uniformed men and women posting up and down in unison on their camels. Each row but the last comprised seven gangly camels, each camel ridden by a soldier, each soldier kitted out a la zouave in identical and pristine red and navy with clean white shirts. Near on four muskets for each of them and powder carried by a small boy running beside each camel. In the whole compound, there were only 12 muskets. Now the first rows of camels stepped onto the pitch road that led into the village. The road was easily wide enough for seven camels across. The cool morning sun had not yet made the surface of the pitch sticky. The camels didn't even break stride. Kima made a noise of dismay. Where was the strong science that the three witches had promised them? Weeks and weeks it had them carting reeking black pitch from the deep sink of it that lay in the gully, rewarming it on fires mixing it with stones and spreading it into this road that led from nowhere to the entrance of the compound and stopped abruptly there. Had they done nothing but create a smooth paved surface by which the army could enter and destroy them? From her position at the head of the Garfoons, the black witch, the Obea Kotiren, showed no doubt. She only pursed her lips and grunted, hm, once. Standing beside her, white mother Letty and the Sibon witch Maridawa did not even that. Kima was worried. 
The three witches should have been behind the Garfoons where they could be protected. If the villagers lost them and their knowledge, they would be at the mercy of the white's fish magic. Yet there the three stood and watched. Akoti then even had her grandson cotched on her hip. So the Garfoons took their cue from the three women. Like them, they kept their ground, ready, but still. Twice, five, whispered Mother Letty. Twice, six. She was counting the soldiers as they stepped onto the black road. Kima thought it little comfort to know exactly how many soldiers had come to kill them, but she found herself counting silently along with Mother Letty. The leading edge of the army was almost upon them, scant yards from the entrance to the compong. Camels covered almost the full length of the road. A few of the Garfoons made ready to charge. Hold, said Mother Letty. Her voice cut through the pounding of the camels. They held. Maridawa turned her wide brown face to the fighters and grinned. She was merry at strange times, the young Sibon witch was. We have almost no chance, she said, but we're going to take the chance we have, yes? True, they would. There was nothing else to do. They all stood suspended between fates, ready as they could make themselves. The soldiers had their muskets at the ready. The barrels gleamed in the sun. The Garfoon's muskets were dull and scorched. So many of them, whispered Kima. She raised her hoe, cocked it ready to strike. Beside her, the white boy Carter whimpered, but clutched his cutlass at the ready, a grim look on his face. He'd said he would rather die than be press-ganged onto the ships once more as a sailor. He had 14 years. If he survived this, the village would let him join the boys to be circumcised, let him become a man. Taunted by the sweetish smell of the curious liquid the witches had had them heat and mix into the pitch, a tiny hummingbird hovered, shimmering black and green, just above the road. Thrice. Six. The man in the first row, in the middle, Da Tiao! Bastard turned against us, muttered Kima. She spat onto the hard-packed road. The thrice seventh haughty camel stepped smartly onto the road, a little ahead of its fellows. That will do it, pronounced the Obea Kotiren. It wasn't quite a question. Nothing happened, save that the hummingbird alighted onto the road. Maridawa hissed in disappointment. Kima blinked. She had something in her eye? The world through her eyes had just jumped and slowed. When it started again, it was somehow different. Then the pitch went liquid. It was that quick. It swallowed the hummingbird in the blink of an eye. Camels began to flounder, then to sink. The villagers gasped, talking excitedly to each other. They had laid the pitch only four fingers deep. How then was it swallowing entire camels and riders? The pitch swamp had not a care for what was possible and what not. It sucked the brigade into its greedy gullet like a pig gobbling slops. Camels mawed in dismay, the pitch snapping their narrow ankles as they tried to clamber out. Soldier men and women clawed at each other, stepped on each other's heads and shoulders to fight free of the melted pitch. To no avail. The last hoarse scream was swallowed by the pitch in scarce the time it took the Obea Kotiren's fifth grandchild. The fat brown boy just passed his toddling age his older sisters and brothers having long since joined the Garfoon fighters, to slip from her arms and go running back for his favorite mango tree. The black face of the Road of Tar was smooth and flat again as though the army had never been. One MAGA row of uniformed soldiers stared back at the Garfoons from the other side of the pitch. Their weapons hung and used from their hands. Then, together, they slapped their camels into a turn and galloped hard for the foot of the hill. All but one who remained a camelback at the bank of the river of pitch. The pistolier slid off her beast. She stood on the edge of where her fellows, suffocated, were slowly hardening. She bent her knees slightly, curling her upper body around her belly. Fists held out in front of her, she screamed full throat at the villagers, a raw howl of grief that used all the air in her lungs and that went on long after she should have had none remaining. She seemed like to spit those very lungs up. Her camel watched her disinterestedly for a while, then began to wander up the hill. It stopped to prop yellow hog plums from a scraggly tree. On the hill above, the general sounded the retreat. In vain, most of his army had already dispersed. Over the next few weeks, many of them would straggle into the Garfield compounds, some with their camels, begging asylum. This they would be granted. It was a good land, but mostly harsh scrub. It needed many to tend it. 
Some few of the Garfoons probed the pitch with their weapons, which did not penetrate. Cautiously, the Garfoons stepped onto the pitch. It was hard once more and held them easily. They began to dance and laugh, to call for their children and their families to join them. Soon there was a celebration on the flat pitch road. An old matron tried to show Carter the steps of her dance. He did his best to follow her, laughing at his own clumsiness. Tempted by the sweetish smell of the strange potion the witches had had them stir into the heated pitch, a fat colibri bird with its iridescent black feathers hovered just above the road. For an instant, the bird looked like a new thing to Kima, as though she'd never seen one before. So much else that happened today was new. The colibri stretched its feet down towards the road and Kima's heart was in her mouth, fearing it would land. They said a colibri would die if its feet ever touched the ground but it pulled its feet in again and flew upwards to join its fellows above in their endless circling flight. Thank you. And now we will hear from Boyang. Um, Fumonima,今度,내가규칙적으로의식을잃는것을받아들이지못하신다내가상자에들어갈때마다창피하신다수시로나를붙들고 포기하지 마라. 너는 나을 수 있다. 고 말씀하신다. 내가 집을 떠나와 사는 것은 그 때문이다. 그분들을 사랑하는 마음도 너를 사랑하는 마음도 변함이 없다는 것을 알아주기 바란다. 내 방법을 다른 기면증 환자들에게도 추천하는데 언제나 그들의 부모님을 설득하기가 쉽지 않다. 아이들이 의식을 잃도록 내버려 두라고 하면 대부분 경악한다. 하지만 내 방식을 따라한 환자들은 대부분 건강해졌다고 답신을 보내온다. 효과가 없다고 말하는 사람들은 내 생각이지만 아마 내 말을 믿지 않고 몰래 아이를 깨우곤 했을 것이다. 죽은 듯 보이는 아이를 몇 시간이고 참고 지켜볼 수 있는 부모는 그리 많지 않다. 내가 읽은 책에는 기면증 환자의 대부분의 지능이 낮다고 한다. 헛소리다. 전문가라는 사람들이 몇 년을 연구해 보았자 평생 기면증 환자로 산 사람이 더 많은 것을 알지 않겠느냐. 기면증 환자에게 나타나는 증상은 그들이 기면증에 저항하기 때문에 생겨나는 것이다. 우리는 의식을 잃을 필요가 있는데 치료는 늘 이를 막는 쪽에 집중되어 있기 때문이다. 기면증 환자가 정신분열 증세를 보인다고 소개하는 책도 있다. 기절한 동안 나타나는 기괴한 환각 때문에 그런 해석이 나온 것 같다. 그에 관해서는 나도 딱히 설명할 방법이 없지만 역시 깨어있는 동안에는 나타나지 않고 그 환각이 나에게도 타인에게도 해를 주지 않는다. 이런 이야기들이 내게는 생소할 것이다. 이전에는 이런 이야기를 한 적이 없으니까. 부모님도 원하지 않으셨다. 그분들은 내게 언제나 내 정상적인 부분, 다른 사람과 같은 부분만을 보여주고 말하기를 원하셨다. 내가 의식을 잃은 모습을 내게 보여주지 않으려 애쓰셨지. 그게 내게 도움이 될 거라고 하셨고 어떤 면에서는 그분들이 오를지도 모르겠다. 나 자신에 관한 문제는 내가 판단하고 결정할 수밖에 없다. 너는 자신을 닮은 사람들로 둘러싸인 세상에 살고 있고 그것을 당연하게 여기지. 하지만 우리 같은 사람들에게 세계는 완전히 다른 모습을 하고 있다. 우리에겐 스승도 제자도 없으며 동료도 소속할 곳도 없다. 일생 스스로를 가르치고 스스로를 공부하며 자신에게 맞는 제도와 환경을 만들어 가야 한다. 그리고 너는 나을 수 있어 라고 말하는 사람들과 싸우며 살아야 한다. 어려운 일이다. 얼마나 많은 아이들이 기면증과 싸우다가 몸과 뇌를 완전히 망가뜨린지 상상도 못할 것이다. 내 입장에서 낳는다는 것은 나와 다른 사람이 되는 것을 의미한다. 다른 사람 입장에서는 자신들과 같은 사람을 하나도 만드는 것이니 아무 상관도 없겠지만 내 입장에서는 나를 버리는 것이다. 내 모든 것을 버리는 것이다. 나는 늘 
의식을 잃을 때면 지구에 대해 생각한다. 밤과 낮이 주기적으로 바뀌는 세상, 더위와 추위, 활동과 비활동이 매일 자리를 바꾸는 세상. 내가 이미 눈치챘는지 모르겠구나. 지구에 빛을 주는 별이 단 하나뿐이라면, 그리고 지구가 매일 한 바퀴 회전한다면, 지구에는 매일 주기적인 어둠이 찾아오게 된다. 내가 발견한 그 동굴 입구처럼 말이다. 그 별은 시간에 따라 빛의 강도가 다른 별이다. 빛과 어둠이 공존하는 세상이다. 나는 그 별의 생물들 대부분이 기면증을 갖고 있으리라고 믿고 있다. 그들 중에는 낮에 활동하는 생물도 있고 밤에 활동하는 생물도 있을 것이다. 그들은 어느 한쪽에 신체를 적응한 뒤 다른 주기에는 신체의 활동을 중지할 것이다. 어쩌면 우리들의 선조 역시 그런 세상에서 왔을지도 모른다고 생각한다. 우리와 지구 사이에 과거의 교류가 있었다면 우리들의 선조도 은하의 외곽에서 이주해 왔을지도 모른다. 그리고 그들이 주기적인 어둠 속에서 살았다면 저 동물 생물들처럼 기면증을 갖고 있었을 것이다. 그렇다면 내가 가진 기면증은 선조로부터 물려받은 것이다. 환경에 자연스럽게 적응한 현상이었을 것이다. 생각하면 할수록 이상한 풍경이다. 지구의 사람들은 어둠이 찾아오면 자연스럽게 각자의 방에 들어가 의식을 잃는 시간을 가질 것이다. 누구도 이를 놀리지 않을 것이다. 그런 사람들을 붙잡고 너는 나올 수 있어 라고 말하지도 않을 것이다. 부모님이 의식을 잃은 아이를 깨우며 눈물을 흘리는 일도 없을 것이다. 아이들이 기면증과 싸우며 자신을 창피해하는 일도 없을 것이다. 치료해야 한다는 생각도 하지 않을 것이다. 밤이 찾아오고 하늘의 별이 빛나면 사람들은 서로에게 잘 기절해 하고 안부를 물을 것이다. 아침이 찾아오면 어젯밤은 잘 기절했느냐고 안부를 물을 것이다. 그곳의 사람들은 아무에게도 방해받지 않고 자연스러운 일을 하듯 행복하게 잠이 들 것이다. 잠이라는 말은 내가 쓴 용어다. 좀덜 부정적인 표현이 필요할 것 같아서 만들어 보았다. 이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이
I suspect that parents who claim to see no improvement are unable to trust the method whole wholeheartedly and tend to prematurely rouse their ch children. Few are those who can stand on the sidelines and simply watch their kids lie seemingly lifeless for hours. Some of the books I've consulted even suggest that those with my condition have low intelligence. That's nonsense. Shouldn't a person who has lived with this condition her whole life know more about it than so-called experts who have only studied it for a few years? Symptoms are only a problem for those who resist the condition. That is to say, people with my condition need to lose consciousness, and yet treatment is always focused on preventing that from happening. One book even asserts that people like me exhibit symptoms of schizophrenia, I assume because of the often bizarre hallucinations we experience during our spells. I do not yet have an explanation for these hallucinations, but unlike with schizophrenia, they never appear while I'm, un while I'm not unconscious and they have never caused harm to me or anyone else. All this is probably new to you as I've never talked to you about it before. Our parents didn't want me to. Their preference has always been that I show only the side of me that is normal and more or less in step with others. All these years, they took pains to keep you from seeing me unconscious. They thought it was for the best and in a way they may have been right. In the end, however, I insist upon my right to be the master of my own circumstances rather than be mastered by them. Perhaps you take it for granted that you live in a world populated by people who are like you, but that very same world appears completely different to people like me. For us, there are no teachers and no students, no colleagues, nowhere to call our own. We must spend hours, oh, sorry. we must spend our lives teaching ourselves toiling away alone to craft a system and an environment that can accom accommodate our needs, all the while fending off those who never tire of saying, you can beat this. It is a demanding task. You have no idea how many innocent children have run themselves ragged, both in body and mind, while fighting a losing battle against this condition. From where I stand, beating what we have looks a lot like turning ourselves into someone we are not. Not that this matters much to those who aren't like us, since it doesn't mean losing one of their own. But for me, it would mean abandoning myself, throwing away everything that is truly me. And we skip towards the end. Every time my unconscious spell approaches, I think of Earth, a world that alternates regularly between light and dark, a world where warmth and cold, activity and rest change places every day. Perhaps you've already guessed it. If there's only one star that lights the earth, and if earth rotates once daily, then darkness comes every day, much like the entrance to the cave that I discovered. The star's light varies in intensity with each hour. It's a place where light and dark coexist. It's my belief that most creatures on that planet have the same condition I do. Some of them may be active while it's light out, and others may be active after dark. Having adapted to one of the two phases, however, they would pause all their activities for the duration of the other phase. I sometimes wonder whether our ancestors could have hailed from a place such as Earth. If indeed there was communication between the two planets in the ancient past, it is not outside the realm of possibility that some of our ancestors might have migrated here from the outskirts of the galaxy. And if they lived in, a per in periodic darkness, then they might also have had a condition like mine and like the creatures in this cave. By this logic, I could have inherited my condition from them, a natural adaptation to the environment from which they originally came. How wonderfully bizarre. Imagine when darkness falls, earthlings casually retreat to their private quarters to enjoy a period of unconsciousness. No one ridicules this habit. No one grips a person by the shoulder and tells them, you can beat this. No parents weep as they try to shake their child back to consciousness. No child has to live in shame because of a condition they came to overcome. No one even thinks of any of this as, this as an affliction that needs to be cured. When the dark phase begins and stars appear in the sky, earthlings tell each other, tell each other go unconscious well. And when the sky turns light again, they ask each other if they had gone unconscious well. They rest happily without being disturbed, as if what they were doing was perfectly natural. Rest is a term I've begun using. 
I felt it was time we found a more positive way to express this state. Thank you so much. And everyone, I hope you can hear me. Thank you so much to everyone for, for the beautiful voices um, and, and readings uh, that, that we just heard. Uh, it's, um, oh, wow, such an honor to hear all of you read um, live in person here. So not in person, but over Zoom. So uh, I'm now going to, to start asking um, questions that I prepared. Um, just three questions. And I'll start first by saying that both of you have just read aloud from works of science fiction that are gorgeously unearthly. At the same time, the Earth, Earth with a lowercase e, Earth with a you know planet Earth capital uh, e, uh, e has a vital place in both excerpts and um, can even be understood as a character, perhaps with a life of its own. In the excerpt that um, Nalo Hopkinson read, uh, and I'm sorry if I miss, I, I, I called it Soul Case, but but perhaps that was the wrong wrong title. But um, but what, from what uh, uh, you read, that the Earth, this living land, this animated pit swamp just charismatically devours the pistoliers and their camels in response to the witch's potent geomantic engineering. Um, and in stars shine in earth sky, earth's, planet earth's circadian meter speaks to the narrator, even though she lives 28,000 light years away on an extra terrestrial planet, perhaps earth's uncanny other, um, where night does not exist and where the need to sleep is considered a disability, a chronic illness. I'm wondering how often and to what extent are you thinking about Earth, earthiness, our planet Earth, uh, and your relationship to this globe when you're writing science fiction and just some possible <laughs> topics and key terms that I, I brainstormed, and I'll just quickly read them aloud here. Um, geography, geomancy, geopolitics, colonialism, east, west, north, south, landscapes, unearthing, roots, rootedness, uprooting, gardening, um, terraforming, ecofeminism, world building, technology, climate emergency, the future of our planet, globalization. Uh, and I realize I just read aloud a really long list of possible places from which you can begin your responses. Maybe we could start by um, saying where you are on this planet Earth right now. I know we're all, you know, you know, in different places. Uh, and um, what time is it? What day is it where you're located right now here in New York City, it's the evening of September 30th, but I know that in Korea, it's already October. So that's my first question. Uh, Boyan? <laughs> <laughs> Whew, it's an essay question. Um, and I am in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, it's 5.08 in the evening of September the 30th. I don't actually know what day it is because I'm in permanent pandemic time, it seems. Every day feels like a Sunday where I have to go to work. Um, but yeah, I think for, for me, I would guess always the earth is part of what I'm thinking of. Even if something is I'm writing is extraterrestrial, it's extra in relation to mm -hmm the world we're on and if there was no rel relation no connectivity maybe I would be truly incomprehensible we're always talking about where we are to some extent and the the pitch swamp in the story um partly um uh was evoked by the 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 pitch lake in Trinidad and Tobago which is a uh, Twin Islands in the Caribbean and Trinidad has a pitch lake that um, Sir Walter Raleigh in I believe the God which century 18th 17th uh, used to to caulk his ships so you know it has this colonizing um, history to it and I wanted it to sort of take itself back <laughs> so there's a lot of, of, of claiming and reclaiming happening mm -hmm. in the story and definitely the earth is the the field of action 
mm -hmm. um, in so much that, that we do and that we talk about. I don't know if it's the same for my colleague. <sighs> え、半額すんだ。その、自分韓国で韓国の動画を。여기는지금あちまうし입니다。その、その、あと、一気に泣くよ。あ、あ、緊張、緊張に注文に固定そう。え、か、あ、か、もろげね。その、ね、本、固定
From whom would you like to hear first? It's it's up to you. Um, I know that uh, reading through um, Bo Young's story, I I was so delighted reading your story uh, because I myself am neurodivergent. I have ADHD. I have nonverbal learning disorder um, and a couple of chronic things. And the voice of that main character and her insistence that this is just me, deal with it, um, was so powerful and so sweet and insistent at the same time that I, I felt very sort of um, affirmed in who I am. Um, and and, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Park, could you uh, convey that perhaps to, to Boyan for me? Actually, I am doing simultaneous interpretations through the chatting Ooh. window for Boyan. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. She asked me. <laughs> wow. So um, yes, I, I do try to to bring that kind of sensibility into my own writing. My the more I live and the more I encounter people, uh, the more I get hopefully to understand people. I begin to wonder if anybody is neurotypical. Um, yeah. You know, scratch the surface and you'll find some sort of divergence from the norm. I'm not sure what purpose the norm serves in terms in terms of writing fiction at least so yes um, and I also became aware at some point that a lot of the characters we fall in love with in our own popular media could be seen as neurodivergent mm -hmm. I mean the 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 new Sherlock Holmes for instance where he'll flat out say I'm, I'm a, a high functioning sociopath the <laughs> any number of characters from Dr. House MD. We love the characters who step outside the box. And um, I, I love them too. I just, I love writing us. Diversity라는 말을 제가 검색을 해서 찾아봤는데요. <웃음> 아, 그러니까 흔히 음, 사람들은 장애인이 더 소수고 정상인이 다수라고 생각을 하는데 저는 그렇게 생각하지 않고요. 사실 거의 대부분의 사람들이 크든 작든 장애를 갖고 살아간다고 생각해요. 그것을 공개적으로 얘기하기를 꺼리는 것 뿐이지. 그리고 나이가 들면 우리 모두가 사실은 장애인이 됩니다. 그래서 신체하고 정신 양쪽에 아무 문제도 없는 사람이 사실 드문데 세상은 그런 극소수의 사람들 중에서도 더 극소수 그러니까 정말 뛰어난 사람들에 대해서만 얘기하는 걸 좋아한다고 생각해요. 저는 반대로 장애가 얼마나 평범하고 많고 일반적이고 그렇기 때문에 하나도 이상하지 않다는 이야기를 하는 것을 좋아합니다. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for your compliments on my work, Nalo. Um, I had to look up the word neurodiversity because <laughs> there isn't one in Korean vocabulary. Yeah. She says, um, people usually think uh, that disabled or differently abled people are the small minority and the rest of us are uh, able, have able bodies. But I would disagree. Most of people have disabilities, small or big. And as we grow older, in the end, everybody becomes come to have a disability. The, those who are so-called healthy, uh, both physically and mentally, are actually quite a small, slim minority. And in the general public discourse, we tend to, to like to uh, take as our standard, even, not even just the slim min minority, but even just the, uh, even among them, to select a few. But I beg to differ. I would like, I like talking about uh, how ordinary, common, and widespread uh, disability is. And therefore, how uh, people with disability are 
nothing, no stranger or have nothing on Nomar about them. Um, can I just say also, I love how there are different languages going on here. I'm learning <laughs> so much. I mean, I, Hanguko Chokom Heo, I, I don't, I'm not fluent. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, I'd speak a little and understand a little bit so I can follow a little bit. Just, I love the fact that there's this translation going on. It's just, I don't know, there's something so moving and stirring about listening to all these voices in different languages. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'm gonna move on to, to the third and last question that I'm gonna ask and then we'll, we'll ask audience members uh, if, if they have questions. So the final question that I prepared was, and, and you, you've already kind of started to answer this question, but um, you've read each other's science fiction now. What questions do you have for each other? You don't have to answer. <laughs> just, <laughs> uh, I just, I, I, I did came, this question just, you know, came to mind because I love the idea of being in dialogue with each other. Uh, 조금 아니, 길게 얘기할 것 같은데 우선 같은 자리에 함께 하게 돼서 정말 영광입니다. 어, 아까 캐나다 원주민 탄압에 대해서 말씀해 주셔서 감사하고요. 저도 기사를 보았고 아주 예, 슬픈 일이라고 생각합니다. 제가 예전에 캐나다하고 미국을 오랫동안 여행한 적이 있는데 너무나 문화가 낯설어서 많이 외로움을 느꼈었는데 그래서 제가 주로 캐나다하고 미국에서 갔던 곳이 원주민 박물관이었거든요. 원주민들이 사는 곳과 왜냐하면 그분들의 그 어떤 생각이나 메시지가 희한하게도 굉장히 오래된 한국의 동양 철학하고 비슷하다는 느낌을 받았어요. 그래서 위로받는 느낌을 많이 받았습니다. 어, 뭐 이쯤에서 번역을 할까요? <웃음> 동역을. <웃음> Okay. First of all, Nalo, I am really honored to be here with you today. And thank you very much for uh, mentioning the uh, history of indigenous people in Canada. Uh, I have uh, some time ago uh, traveled to North America, both Canada and United States. And I felt uh, quite lonely because the culture was so different from Korea. And I kept I found myself uh, drifting toward the uh, indigenous people, their museum, their residence, because the messages and thoughts that I discovered there uh, had certain resonance with the East Asian philosophy. Uh, <laughs> 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 세계 페미니즘 단편선에 실린 유리병 마술인데 아, 제가 그 소설이 푸른 수염의 우아라고 생각하지 못해서 후반부에 큰, 크게 놀랐습니다. 한국은 지금 여성과 소수자와 페미니즘을 다룬 SF가 크게 유행을 하고 있어서 그런 작품도 많이 들어오고 있어요. 하지만 그 유행이 시작된 지 얼마 안 돼서 아직 들어오지 못한 작품이 많은데 한국인들이 호킨스 씨의 작품을 더 많이 볼수 있게 되기를 기대합니다. So uh, in Korea, Nalo, your story, The Glass Bottle Trick, has been translated and included in the anthology, Sisters of the Revolution, a feminist speculative fiction anthology, titled as such in Korean. Yeah. Uh, and when I read that, I didn't know it was rewriting of Bluebeard. So I was very surprised toward the end. <laughs> uh, in Korea now, the science fictional works about women, gender minorities, as in minorities, feminism, uh, are gaining uh, increasing popularity. But it hasn't been long since the trend began. And so I hope in the future, Koreans can read more of uh, Nala's stories. Thank you. Um, that actually leads me into what I was curious about reading your work, because I read um, not only the story about stars shining in the sky, but also the introduction where you say this is a story about breasts. And I have had the experience of having a, a former student of mine, um, I believe he's Canadian, who now lives in Korea, who is an English teacher, 
who um, teaches a novel of mine that is similarly written in Caribbean vernacular. And he said, um, he first had to explain to his students why anybody would want to write in common speech, because that's what I'm doing. Because um, I asked him to explain that. And he said, it's, it's something to do with writing is seen as respectable. So you want to sound as though you have good command of the language, which, which I understand. But I wondered if, uh, based on the two pieces I've read from you, um, and based on what my former student has said, is it really, is it, it's, do you get a lot of pushback for being a woman science fiction writer? Do you, uh, yeah, let me go with that. Okay, I think uh, uh, it was uh, it was difficult to type. So let me translate in in interpret in Korean. Um, uh, 이제 그 말씀을 들으니까 생각나는 바가 있는데 그 선집에서 어, 어, 가슴을 위한 속도 읽으셨고 다른 작품들도 읽으셨는데 어, 정말 그렇게 한국에서 페미니스트 SF 작가로 글을 썼을 경우에 어, 어떤 백래시 그러니까 에, 어떤 반응을 받으시는지 왜냐하면 그 어, 가슴 위한 속어를 읽었을 경우에 약간 부정적인 반응이 있는 것처럼 보였기 때문에 에, 그리고 음, 본인의 작품에 대해서는 하, 아, 한국에서 근무하는 영어 선생을 하고 있는 제자가 있는데 소설을 한국 제자, 학생들이랑 읽었을 때왜 그렇게 이제 대화책 그, 그 구어체로 그죠? 예, 예, 원주민들의 구어체로 글을 쓰냐 한 점을 논의했었대요 그래서 그런 관련해서 이제 작가님이 쓰시는 경우에 그, 자, 그 한국 독자들이 반응이 어떤지 특히 페미니스트 SF 쪽으로 썼을 때 네, 그걸 물어보셨습니다. 그러니까 이게 그 상당히 복잡한데 저는 사실은 데뷔하고 한 10년 동안은 어 제가 여자라는 사실 자체를 아무도 모르는 듯한 느낌이 들었어요. 일단 제 존재 자체가 인식이 안 되고 여자라는 사실이 인식이 안 되고 작가라는 사실이 인식이 안 되고 그러고 몇년 전에 이제 페미니즘 물결이 일어나면서 음 여러 여성 단체와 여성 행사에서 저를 불러서 내가 여자인 걸 지금 깨달았나? <웃음> 라는 느낌이 들어가 이게 백래시라는 것도 페미니즘이 어느 정도 이제 긴 시간이 있어야 오는 것이라 <웃음> 어 저는 그리고 이것도 어떤 중간 단계라고 생각하는데 저는 여성 작가가 아니라 그냥 여, 작가이기 때문에 <웃음> 아, 그러게요. 음, 예, 백래시가 오기 위해서도 더 많은 것이 필요한 것 같아요, 제 생각에는. <웃음> Okay. okay, so uh, she's saying that um, it's rather complicated. Uh, and in fact, I know the historical context, but let me see how I can translate. So for a good 10 years since my debut, uh, people didn't, didn't treat me as a writer because she's writing SF. And nor did they treat her as a particularly woman writer, particularly woman. Like within SF world, it wasn't very uh, highlighted that she is a woman. Uh, because of the sheer lack of sensib feminist sensibility. So she thinks the backlash itself requires a certain uh, <laughs> feminist awareness. And uh, it's, uh, since a few years ago, and she's referring to 2016, uh, when feminist uh, social activism have uh, resurged in Korea, uh, this and that organization would certainly invite her and ask her to speak as a woman writer. <laughs> And so now she, she feels like I'm just a writer. I'm not a woman writer, right? Yeah, uh, so that's uh, what she, that's what she stuck with her answer. Yeah. It is very, very complicated. And <laughs> I'm also struck by your saying that when you came to North America, you, you felt so lonely and that you were gravitating towards um, indigenous and uh, First Nations expression. And in North America, there is a history. It happened in Florida. It happened in, uh, certain, in certain parts of BC, in Salt Springs, I believe, where um, enslaved Africans who got away or their families or their, their, their you know, children who got away and ran into, um, away from the plantations were sometimes taken in by indigenous communities, seen as perfectly human, as human as they are and made full members of the community. Um, 
and I, I, I sense that act of sheer humanity towards us and towards my ancestors um, very, very strongly. It, it practically brings tears to my eyes that in the middle of this horrible um, thing that was happening to us both uh, through globalization and colonization that there were communities that could look at uh, a person of African descent and say, hello cousin, come on in. Um, so I do feel like I need to speak up when and where I can. Uh, I also love these connections that you find amongst cultures that you don't expect. Um, for us in the English speaking Caribbean, we have a sense of hot and cold in terms of health. So tea, even though it's hot, is seen as cooling. So you drink tea to cool the body down and you'd be very careful about sitting you know, on something cold because the cold can transfer to yourself. And I've had discussions with people from um, Asian cultures where there's a similar sensibility. And I don't know if it's because uh, after African slavery was over, they started bringing in uh, indentured laborers from China, from India. And so there's been a big mixing of culture, but I love these moments where we can sort of look at each other and go, oh, you do that too. <laughs> Wonderful, and we are getting questions from audience members. Uh, I hope it's okay if I. Take a... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Continue하고 질문을 안 했습니다. 아 저기 제가 그 블랙하트 맨을 검색을 하니까 그 버니 웨일러란 자메이카 가수 음악이 나와서 제가 들으면서 이 소설을 읽었는데 그 혹시 그 연관이 있는지 말씀해 주실 수 있는지. So, uh, yeah, she wanted to ask this question before. Uh, uh, when she looked up your title, Nalo, Black Heart Man, uh, the singer, Bonnie Whaler, Jamaican singer's song came up. So she listened to the song while reading your story. And she's wondering the mutual relate, uh, in the interrelation between the two. And uh, yeah, so that's a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is a, um, a thing that in parts of the English speaking Caribbean, parents used to tell their children to make them behave, to threaten them. And it was um, in Barbados, they'd say, if you don't behave, the heart man will come and get you. In Jamaica, they say the black heart man. So that's probably where Bunny Whaler got it from. Uh, and the idea is that the heart man or the black heart man, a long time ago was this man who uh, kidnapped children um, excuse me if there are parents or children in the audience, kidnapped children and would cut their hearts out and eat them. And there is no evidence that this ever happened, but the, the, the story is a thing to scare children with. Um, you find in parts of at least the English speaking Caribbean. And for me being Jamaican, the, the, the word black heart, we have so much very, very old English still being used in Jamaica, black heart and blackguard. Um, are the same word. Uh, and so I was using that, that sense of the blackguard meaning the scoundrel um, and, and marrying it with the story of the Blackheart man um, and a bunch of other things because, uh, you know, probably, probably the fiction just is like that. It, it accumulates, it's, it's like compost. It's, for me anyway, it's not very linear. But that's, that's how that ended up in there. Thank you for listening to Bunny Whaler. <laughs> <웃음> 사실 제가 처음 들은 자메이카 음악이었는데 정말로 아름다웠다고 전해 주셨으면 좋겠습니다. That was the first song I ever heard of Jamaican music. Beautiful song. Thank you. Good one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I um think maybe should we move uh, should we ask the uh, the question that, that an audience member posed? I think I should read this aloud. This is from Nin M. Um, in thinking about translated literature, how works that get translated aren't necessarily intended for the audience they are translated to. Do you think particular aspects of your writing are lost in translation? Or on the other side of the question, is there anything you have learned from having your work translated uh, in that 
uh, international interpretations have altered your way of viewing and understanding your own work. Thank you to Min M for the question. I do have an answer for it. Um, and yes, some, very often things get lost in translation. My translated works don't tend to receive as strong a reception as, as my mm -hmm. works written in forms of English. And those that I can read, um, it's sometimes because they haven't, if I've written in vernacular, if I've written in common speech, they haven't translated it into common speech. They've translated it into the standard form of the language. Um, and also cultural nuances get lost. There was a story, a short story of mine where the, the part of the story hinges on one of the main characters saying to his girlfriend, oh no, of course I'm not, you know, uh, as emphatic as you want me to be. Of course, I don't make a lot of noise. Look at me, I'm a big black man. I got translated in French into, look at me, I'm a fat black man. It's fat and big are the same word. And he was a fat black man. So, <laughs> but it, it completely elided all of the, the racial and cultural nuances and, uh, things like that have made me realize that language is an aspect of world building. And if you're not translating the way the language is used, you're losing an important layer of the story. And that is key to science fiction and fantasy. Uh, 어떻게 될지 궁금해하는 거는 한국어에는 그 어, 희나 쉬의 이때 대응하는 그 대명사를 거의 쓰지 않죠. 예, 저희는 성별 중립적인 언어라고 생각을 해요. 그래서 음, 제 소설은 그 성별이 나중에 등장을 하거나 아니면 성별이 모호한 채로 나오는 작품들이 있는데 이게 영어로 번역될 때는 반드시 여자나 남자 둘 중에 하나로 정해야 하잖아요. 그래서 번역자가 저에게 누가 여자고 누가 남자냐고 물어본 적도 있는데 만약에 논바이너리면 어떡하냐고 둘 중에 하나로 물어보는 걸까 하고 언제나 좀 궁금해하는 편이에요. 그게 아마 언제나 그게 다르게 번역이 되겠죠. So since I can't read my own translation, uh, I can't uh, quite tell you about the nuance change. Uh, one thing that stands out to me is that in Korean, uh, we don't have she and he. There's only one pronoun for that. Or uh, there's one pronoun that can also be it. Uh, it can be he or she or it. So uh, I, when I write, I deliberately sometimes uh, leave the gender ambiguous. But then English translators always ask me to choose <laughs> between this binary she and he. And uh, so, yeah, that's, I feel awkward, right? It's just always uh, uh, my characters have to then take on this definite gender. Yeah. I love that. I love that pronouns came up. Uh, it, it, this dialogue, just the fact that different languages have different ways of um, sort of formalizing units of subjectivity. Um, and actually one of the questions I thought of asking had to do with pronouns. I, I didn't ask it, but it's, you know, I, I think a lot about um, the ways in which, uh, uh, you know, pronouns, the way I think, uh, uh, you know, in Korean and, and English and, and many different languages, uh, there are different grammars for articulating consciousness and subjectivity. Anyway, I, and, and, and it came to mind also, because I know that both, both of you um, uh, um, often um, write about sort of ways in which uh, people like switch skins, right? Or switch, switch bot, or, you know, that there's like a lot of that, that kind of consciousness traveling going on. So anyway, but I'm, I'm, I'm seeing another question um, here. I need to get to, so, uh, this is from Jules. Hello, Jules, and Jules asks, Okay, um, so Nala Halkinson mentioned how many characters in popular media can be seen as neurodivergent, they're beloved. How can we write and use those characters to translate into real life acceptance of neurodivergent individuals? 
Thank you, Jules. That's a tough question. And I believe the writers are already doing it, uh, including writers for media, because it used to be way more common that if you were going to see a character, you, you could characterize as neurodivergent. Uh, and I'm not saying that they were, but that they were sort of roughly painted that way. They would often be the bad guy, um, the, the misunderstood, but you know, angry sort of um, bad guy. And now that's not as common joker, I'm talking to you. Um, it's not as common. Now they tend to be more beloved, but no less stereotyped. Um, I think all we can do is keep doing it. Uh, and uh, as, as uh, my colleague here has said, nobody is, people who are neurotypical or people who are normal are probably so vanishingly small that I think people recognize themselves. Um, and appreciate that. I know that readers tell me when they do. Um, so I think the more we keep doing it, the more acceptance will come. Um, writers change worlds, so I think we will. Is it oh, Marianne, did you want... Okay, uh, me too. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, 제 경험을 이야기하면 저희 오빠가 발달 장애인데, 어, 사실 저는 어렸을 때 오빠하고만 놀았기 때문에 이제 학교에 들어간 다음에 일반인이 행동하는 방식을 보고 굉장히 낯설게 느꼈어요. 그 제가 소설을 쓰는 많은 내용이 아마 그 낯설음에 대한 이야기일 거예요. 그래서 제가 정말로 믿는 바는 결국 장애인을 이상하게 여기거나 소수자를 이상하게 여기는 건 그게 여러분에게 익숙하지 않아서라는 거죠. 창작은 그 낯설음을 익숙하게 만든다고 생각을 합니다. 그런 면에서 의미가 있다고 생각을 해요. Uh, I have a brother. I grew up with a brother with this developmental disability. So when I first went to school, I found a bit strange to be around people with, uh, uh, who don't have such disability. So I believe that when we find that we find this uh, differently abled people strange, just because we are not used to them. Uh, creative works, the stories could uh, contribute to familiarizing the readers with their conditions. And so that's, I think, where we can help. I'm thinking uh, just your, your, this wonderful conversation is reminding me of uh, Sister Mine and sort of the, the possible ways in which Sister Mine and actually also Starshine and Earth Sky can be in dialogue with one another since they are both about you know, um, siblings who have been um, distanced uh, from one another in, in one way or, in, uh, or another. But uh, anyway, that's maybe it's topic for a different conversation. There are, so, uh, there are so many ways in which we could continue this rich and vibrant conversation, um, but we're um, about to uh, wrap up. Um, and I uh, maybe really quickly, is, is there anything that you, you wanted to say but didn't get to say? Uh, I guess that, that, that's sort of the final question I have uh, for you. Is there something you really, really wanted to to share uh, before we we uh, conclude this this wonderful dialogue. Um, I just would like to thank you, everybody, for for making this happen. Um, I think translation is one of the key challenges that science fiction fantasy face. There's so much amazing work being done out there, and. Um, particularly Anglophone speakers who tend not to have, at least in North America, to not have as many languages uh, are missing out on. So the, the, just the generosity of everybody. Um, mm. Thank you all so much. Yes, Kaya Press and, and um, Nilanjana, thank you for your, your visionary uh, work here. You've really, this is 
um, Nilanjana's uh, vision. She's the one who came up with this idea. So thank you to 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 Nilanjana and also Kaya Press and San Young and everyone here. <laughs> thank you for being here. And yes, absolutely. And and if, I don't want to leave out um, the others uh, other participants. If there's anyone who, who you know wants to, is there something that you want to say before we close? I don't want to you know leave any possible comments just you know un unvoiced. So. I would like to thank you, Sayang, for hosting us at Queen's College, Kumi. Oh. It's been an honor to visit, e-visit your campus. E-visit, exactly, virtual <laughs> visit, yes. <laughs> um, perhaps uh, someday in the, in the near future, uh, we can continue this conversation in, in person. So thank you again. Thank you so, so much. Uh, it really is, as Neil Antonio says, a, a dream come true. And, um, and I hope there are spaces online where maybe this kind of conversation can continue. And, um, and I, I wish everyone rest <laughs> to, to, you know, go back to Kimbo Young's story. I hope we all uh, can, can breathe and, and, you know, in, in, this, in this, these difficult times, just sort of, uh, just, just be. <laughs> I, I don't know how to finish that sentence, but um, but that's uh, I just I just wish the best for all of us and each of us. So thank you again.